Art is Hard. My name is Alicia DeSantis, founder of 38th and Kip Studio, a branding, design, and illustration studio. Today, we have the graphic designer, photographer, multidisciplinary artist, Julian Montague, based out of Buffalo, New York. A tremendous artist who creates uh, immersive environments, immersive experiences and narratives using design and typography. I've been wanting to have him on the show for a while now, and I'm so excited to be able to interview him. And really just one of the very best artists and designers uh, you can find uh, in the contemporary world. Julian is a Buffalo-based artist, a 1996 graduate of Hampshire College in Amherst, Massachusetts. He has no formal education in any of the disciplines he currently practices, which is pretty incredible. Since the late 1990s, Montague has been making art with a multidisciplinary approach, an undercurrent of existential humor. His artwork takes many different forms, from multi-year conceptual investigations to making an ephemera of fictional 1970s art institution to hard edge abstract paintings. His work is largely concerned with exploring and reframing the systems of order that we make sense of natural and man-made worlds. Uh, he questions the supposed harmony uh, to reveal the absurdity that lies beneath it. Uh, relying on graphic design plays a huge role in his artwork. He's received attention from Dwell, Freeze, It's Nice That, and many others. 2021, the New York Times recommended his Instagram account as one of the top art accounts to follow. And I would definitely second that. His, his uh, Instagram is incredible. He has worked in the collections in the Albright Knox Art Gallery, Martin Z. Margulis, the Norton Museum of Art, and the Progressive Insurance Company, and numerous private collections. Uh, his mid-career res- retrospective is happening now at the Birchfield Penny Art Center in Buffalo. His book, The Stray Shopping Carts of Eastern North America, a guide to field identification, revised edition, will be published at the University of Chicago Press, fall of 2023. So stoked to have him on the show. So let's go ahead and welcome him in. Welcome back, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I have Julian Montague here, acclaimed designer, photographer, mid-century modern extraordinaire. Thank you so (laughs) much for being on the show with me. Oh, thank you for having me. It's uh, it's really a, an extra special honor because you've been so busy with your um, mid-career retrospective and moving and just you are doing a lot of stuff right now. Yeah, yeah. It's a very crazy moment. So um, I, I, uh, I'm trying to keep, keep my head together through it all. Well, congratulations on the exhibit. It really is tremendous. And... Uh, I'm just in awe of how many pieces and the breadth and depth of work that was displayed. Um, yeah, I was <clears throat> really excited to do this show and I approached the virtual penny art center where I have, have the show um, with the, I just knew that I, I, I needed a chance to pull all these projects together because I think some people know me from one thing, something from another. And then a lot of them don't know that I'm the same person that did those things or haven't seen one or the other. And I just, that urge, I think a lot of art, you often have as an artist of just wanting to like put your whole deal out there, you know? Um, so it was, it's very satisfying in that way to kind of, and interesting just to, for myself, just to put it all together and, and be like, okay, what, what am I really doing here? What have I done the last 25 years? Um, yeah. So it's been, it's been a cool process to do that. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's one of the, the benefits of being an artist is that you can actually put everything together and say, what have I done over the past 25 years <laughs> that a lot of people can't do? <laughs> yeah, I think in a lot of jobs, it doesn't, you, know, you can't add it up or put it all together or display it or whatever, you know, it's, uh, it's a different yeah. kind of trajectory. And then it's, for me, the, the I mean, I'm a reflective person, but I weirdly hadn't been that reflective about kind of, and I, and I could always talk about what were the themes of my work, but sometimes when you look at it as a whole, you really see more of those like, ticks and tendencies that you have or the things you keep coming back to. And, um, and I think, and then, and then having the opportunity to have, see, 
how these things are very different, like speak to each other or kind of connect. That's one of the things I want to do with the show is put those things next to each other so that people can see the connections and then I can see the connections myself. Yeah, right on. Well, big congrats on that. I know much work that goes into it and really just a stellar piece. So for all of our fans listening, uh, where is the exhibit currently and how long is it running? Yes, so it's at the Birchfield Penny Arts Center in Buffalo, New York, uh, and it's running from now until October 29th. Uh, So it's up for quite a while. And this actually is, if you are in the general region, southern Ontario, you know, northern Pennsylvania, eastern Ohio, um, this is a good summer to visit Buffalo because the Albright Knox, now called the Buffalo AKG Museum, which is a sort of major international institution in Buffalo, um, has just had its new, um, it's just opened after several years of being closed and it's doubled in size with a new addition designed by OMA Architects. And so it's like, and that's right across the street from where my show is. So if, if there's ever a good time to visit uh, for art purposes, like this is probably the summer for it. Yeah, we need to have City of Buffalo sponsor this this episode yeah absolutely (laughs) they're not gonna get better publicity than this come on (laughs) true right on well let's talk about your piece in the spirit of the uh in the the format of this video cast so i have your chosen work in front of me here and i can't help but but smile when i look at it uh wildlife incursions into modern architecture interdisciplinary symposium part three (laughs) <laughs> um, yeah, so there's a, a lot of background to what this is, um, and this sort of gets to sometimes some of the difficulties of like displaying my work because uh, some things are in pretty complicated conceptual spaces that require a little bit of knowledge to understand what you're looking at. So what is this? It is a book, a fake book. Uh, I, I took an old library book and I made a new cover for it, printed it out, and then put it underneath the plastic cellophane so it looks instantly worn and real and it's done in a mid-century style and this is part of a of a, a series of fictional books fake books faux books uh that i made as part of a larger project about the intersection of animals and architecture and so that i originally started out with a project called to know the spiders where i captured spiders and sort of preserved them you know sort of scientifically preserved them in jars that kind of thing and i I made, I looked at them through micro, their faces through a microscope and made drawings of their faces, which I then made into fabric banners, which I then photographed in the room where I collected the spiders. So these very like simplified, weird alien spider faces, sort of more like icons or symbols, are sort of photographed in these domestic spaces. And it's a very strange effect because it's this sort of, um, these black and white banners. So they have a real sort of weird alien feel and sort of this sort of a little bit of a death's head kind of thing in this domestic space. So this project was all about thinking about what's happening in the peripheral spaces of our buildings, which is mostly spiders are there um, and they're everywhere um, all the time. And so just trying to kind of think about what that, think about that relationship, or explore that relationship. And so the first part was this project where I made these photographs, did these collections, these investigations. And then the project sort of expanded into this broader examination of that those spaces and kind of architectural space and the way animals live with us and around us. Not so much pets and things, but just the other little activities that are happening. Um, and so as I, I previously worked on this project about identifying stray shopping carts, where I had a taxonomy for identifying carts and based on the situations in which you find them. And that was a project where I, it was like there was a fictional version of myself who wrote it who was just a taxonomist who only cared about figuring out this the way stray shopping carts operated. So there's a lot of text in the project. And I wrote it in a very dry way, very really trying to stick to the rules of the conceptual space of the project. So it became funny because I was so dedicated to taking it seriously. Um, but it was also my first time where I was working with the idea of working through a fictional author. In other words, not saying it's my voice exactly, but kind of creating a character and then creating the work through that character, which is a way of focusing the kind of conceptual space. So when I get to this, so I've done this thing project with the spiders, and then I'm thinking of how to expand that investigation of that world. And I kind of came to think of a a kind of a, there there was a person at the center of the project who you didn't know their motives exactly, but they were kind of the author of the work. And somehow that distancing helped me just do things that were even weirder without having to maybe justify them in a concrete way. These are all things that no one really cares about when they're looking at the work. It's just sort of, 
I guess, a device or for me, it's always important to construct the rules of the world I was working in. Um, so all that comes around to, <laughs> I realized by the time I got to this idea of making fake books, I'd been blogging about mid-century book covers for a while, pre-Instagram. Like, so I had a blog, I did a blog project where I was going to, where I post like a book every day. I did that for a couple of years and I would go to thrift stores and stuff. And over time, I, mean, I already liked modernist style, but I really refined my eye because I was digging for books all the time. And I ended up finding ones that designers I really liked and really getting specific about that style. So I had that in my head. I was interested in mid-century book covers. And I realized that I could make these book, fake books and present them as the reading material for this character kind of at the center of the project. And those books... I mean, I guess I stumbled into this a little bit because I didn't know how they would really function as art, but it ended up being this amazing way. I kind of made them as this supplement to the other work I was making. It wasn't just the spider banners, but it was these other other little projects related to this architectural space and, and insects, spiders. But what I realized the power of the fake book was is that it, some, well, one, sometimes people thought they were real. I put like, say there were 10 books in an exhibit there in a glass case. But even if you knew they were fake, you you have to kind of think, well, what would that book be about? So in this one, kind of this is one of the earliest ones, maybe like 2010, like 2011. Um, it it's like, well, okay, there's a symposium on like people like we're talking about modern architecture, and like so this is about like kind of pest control in modern buildings, one of those issues. Like one way or another, you I'm bringing you, leading you, the viewer, into thinking about some of the themes that I want to bring to the rest of this work, and so. Kind of discovering that that book cover and then the book, the fake, the fact that it's wrapped around a real book um, and so it presents physically as a book in physical space. It does like, even when you know it's fake, you're like, what's in that book? You know, what is it? I was just thinking the... that. Yeah. So well, I was thinking a... that just what's in it from a, from a, um, a, a conceptual point of view, but what really is in the book? What is the well, book? That's what, yeah, people seem interested in that, which is like not that interesting to me because it's just like whatever book it is, like the right size. I think size. it's just human curiosity. It's human no, I curiosity, know. you know? It is. It is. Um, yeah, it's whatever book is like the right size. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. of the thing. So they're about any random subject. Um, but, and there's nothing on the back, there's only just like my little symbol and like the date. Um, but the, the way the books, and then I've sold a bunch of these, but I mean, through the gallery I used to work with in New York, like, we sold a bunch of books as, you know, sculptural objects, basically. Like, unfortunately, I made the additions yeah. too short. I have to read them every time. But, um, but so that's like, so this book is, is one of many, one of now that, that project has maybe like 60 different books in it. Um, and then that expanded into these other fictional worlds where I make, like, I have a, a gallery called the Thorold Gallery, which is a fictional 1970s gallery. And so for that, I make these exhibition posters for artists that I've made up. And I also make books for that and booklets and catalogs. So it's a similar thing of like, I, for that, I was like, oh, okay, I can create this conceptual space of this fictional gallery. And it allows me to kind of use all these different art techniques or visual ideas I have and put them in the world of here's an exhibition poster. And then the viewer, for one, that's sort of the, there's, for me, the aesthetics of making the poster and the kind of working this mid-century style and trying to make a compelling image. But then it's also the the viewer gets to uh, or is invited to kind of like imagine that what would that exhibition be? You know what I mean? So it's these sort of doorways into to uh, it's like writing fiction where you're implying these these other worlds, but doing it with this ephemera basically. Yeah, it really is incredible, and it's it's something that I think could lend itself really well to uh, you know and. Well, let me go back. So I, th I feel like the in the art world, for at least the, the general non-artist, is leaning more and more towards installation and what we call immersive art with like Meow Wolf. Are you familiar with Meow Wolf? I am. Uh, yeah, I am. But I've never, I mean, I've never experienced Meow Wolf, but yeah. I'm aware of the phenomenon. Yeah. I, I haven't either. It's like five miles for me and I haven't gone, uh, yeah. admittedly. But I think this idea of, the art transcending into the experience and having like a full blown narrative around it is really fascinating to people. And I'm wondering if you've ever considered 
having a, like a mockumentary video on some of this? Well, it's funny you mention that because in my exhibit, there is, um, I have a video piece that was directed by a friend of mine. I did, I mean, I sort of added the sort of prompts and things, but we have two friends, two people that we know that are, uh, I don't know if they're actors exactly, but we basically have them riff on, like they're talking about, the, they're art critics talking about the Thorold Gallery. So it's a, in the video, it's a 10 minute video and they're going off and let's talk about the specific artists and these posters. So they're sort of like expanding my fictional world by pretending to be these people that had been to these shows and things. Um, so I think there's potential in that, that side of that. In, in yeah. A way. So yes. So it sort of started down that road essentially. Yeah. I'm just, which is interesting. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh no, no. I mean, which I, I don't know. I don't have the links up for that yet, but that, that, that whole video is on YouTube. So it, it, um, you can see them talk about it. and these guys are it's a very funny video <laughs> right on i'll post the i'll post the link in our um in our uh, feed below here uh, when i'm uh, producing it reminds me of like i can imagine something like an early 1970s you know with kind of that flute the kind of grainy <laughs> flute music, like, like the documentary on pbs exactly yeah, like, the, the, yeah. this makes the sound a little bit off or whatever yeah <laughs> Welcome to wildlife incursions into modern architecture. And then there's like, it's cut with like a scene of birch trees in autumn or like a waterfall. So, <laughs> Just, no, I don't, I don't know exactly what you mean. Although of course, once you start making like, yeah, things get complicated fast. When you start yeah. Moving pictures. Um, but now that, but I, I still, I like those ideas a lot. Yeah. So how do you, in terms of methodology, as you said, you have 60 so you have 60 fictional book covers within this sort of series. Yeah, and, and if you count in the broader other related things or the Thorold Gallery stuff too, it's more like a hundred something, or, yeah. Um, but that's not, you know, that's, yeah, I just, uh, because the book covers, they're relatively easy to, not easy, but you know, there it's a loose sort of thing. Like I might have the idea for an image, and then I kind of think of the title after that. You know, or it's it's not sort of it's my ideas come easily to it. It's sort of generative, I guess, is what I'm mm -hmm. getting at. Mm -hmm. um, like it doesn't feel like a struggle to be like I want to make a fake book. Like what's it going to be? It's sort of like you just need some little kernel of inspiration. And for me, anyway, it's a format that's that's um, so easy to work in. And I, I mean, as a designer and as an artist, I really a lot of my work does have is about language and image together, and of course, design is like that's what design is basically. Um, but so to me, I really enjoy the way that words and images interact. Um, so so like making the covers is a really enjoyable way to 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 play around with that kind of thing. So so like I said, I could have some weird image. I'm like, what could? How could this relate to this project? You know, or like what would it? So the image what would, what, drives it. Sometimes, I mean, sometimes if there's a title and I make, I come up with the words and I, then I make the title, but sometimes it is just like, yeah, like, okay, this is an interesting image. What, what could this, what would make sense as a book cover? And then also try something as like the book covers is, is trying to push them a little bit to like, you know, they want on the edge of like being like hard to believe it's real. Do you know what I mean? But also being yeah. real. Some are more believable than others, but like the weirder, more esoteric ones, I think are. But then it's like, you, that's a very fragile thing too. Because then you don't want it to be like jokey or sort of silly. Yeah. Um, the closest I get, I like, I mean, which I like, or, or like intuition and pest control is one of them that is my early books, the kind of a pairing to this one that I have here. And that that one where it's like, yeah, it's like, what is this song? Like sort of weird kind of occult kind of thing. And, I have, and so there's, there's a fictional cult within this world. Like it's the Waldron Institute which sort of works into this animals and architecture thing. So I have a whole series of books from this sort of cult that starts out as a medieval like beekeepers guild and then becomes like sort of a Scientology kind of type thing. So <laughs> create these backgrounds that kind of make, like allow these weirder things to develop. Um, yeah. But then it's, it, it, you go to these wormholes and then you, you know, it gets harder for people to, you, you just need to maintain the entry points so that people know what, what you're talking about. And in the current ex exhibition, it's hard because well, I mean, the public is just, it's hard to get people to focus. Um, to, so sometimes it's like, you, 
I have all these fake posters up on one side of the gallery, you know, and then there's my shopping cart project, which is these are all different voices, you know what I mean? And different techniques. And then I have my real posters I've designed like down the hallway next to that. And, and so getting people to understand like, this is fictional stuff and this is real stuff. And this, you know, it's, it's um, a little challenging. Yeah. And I think the beauty in that, and I've talked with, with several folks on the show about that, is that, does it even matter? Does it even matter what they, if they're there and they're experiencing it? Does it matter just, what the narrative is? No, I don't think. I think the I don't think the narrative narrative matters. I do, but I am just like. But the one thing I do want them to know is like I think some people sometimes with my fake posters, people are like, "Oh, you like curated these posters." Do you know what I mean? To yeah. hang with work. So, and then they're like, wait, you designed all these things, you know, or you made all these things. Mm -hmm. That's the part where it's like, yeah, I want you to know I made the stuff. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. We need, as a baseline, <laughs> they need to know that it was created by you, not just that's, curated that, by you. Exactly. That's like, that's my cutoff. You know, after that, yeah, I feel like you need to know I made it and I didn't, and, and that, that it just, just know that it's a project that is about creating these fake things. Um, yeah. And then, then, then I don't get too, I'm not too picky. Like people have to understand every nuance, but you know, it, it's, um, you, you, it's out of your control once you, it leaves your, you know, once it's on the wall. Yeah. And it's hard, you know, it's hard in a discipline like this, like to our listeners that, that aren't artists, maybe they don't realize how challenging it can be to create art that is outside the frame of like, you know, watercolor sunsets or you know cloud photography like it, it's really hard so i'd love if you could speak on that a little bit hard in the sense of like of making it or of presenting it or um... of, of i think with most artists and correct me if i'm wrong there's an urge to have the audience understand where you're coming from and you really really want them to to see your vision yeah and the further you get away from the tra the traditional within kind of our yeah. our culture of art, the harder it is to really just get them to understand where you're coming from. Yeah, no, that is definitely a challenge. So, I mean, I'm definitely, I, I don't like shows where you have to go and like read a ton of text to understand yeah. what is going on. And uh, on the other hand, um, well, so, okay. So I, I do, so I have a couple of different things to say about it. Uh, I think my most successful project in that way is my project about shopping carts because um it because it's presented as like a study of shopping carts it speaks directly to a viewer right like it's like it's explaining to you what it is in the text it's like here are the different categories of shopping carts and that works really well because it's also addressing something people know which is this phenomenon of shopping carts not being in the store being on the street and so it's a way that like people who are not art people or gallery goers or whatever still engage with the work because it's giving language to something that they know but haven't articulated. And then it's funny when they read the detail with which someone else has articulated it. So, and, and I find that that project, which has started in 99 and I've showed a lot in the early 2000s. Um, so I've seen a lot of people see the work um, and it's amazing how much they'll read you know, and like how much, how engaged they are with that work and like, and, and, it, and they'll go, they'll stand there and read the whole thing because it's engaging and funny. And it's, it's, it's reaching out because it's, they, it's something they know already. And I always, with my project, I try to have a way, always have a way in. Like I, I want to take, I mean, then with my next project with the, this, like we were talking about the spiders and the animals and architecture, that's a much more esoteric project uh, without as much direct dialogue. But I did, well, I did want to get at, it was about investigating something that we all know, you know, or think we know, the sort of the spider and so forth. Um, so I'm always trying to find a way to reach, to, to, to give a hook in so that you know where to, to start. Um, now that's yeah. changed. The, the funny thing is with, with the, so I, I've deliberately tried to, to be helpful to the viewer. Um, but it is frustrating. The weird thing about the shopping cart thing is that or, there's a way in which people um, sometimes are just assuming that when you're like speaking through an art project that you're speaking in your direct voice is a very direct form of personal expression. 
um, as opposed to taking on other voices and so forth. Um, where like no one questions that with acting, but also when people like sing songs, people tend to think like you're speaking your truth or whatever. Do you know what I mean? As yeah, opposed to like yeah. people, any singer song or singer songwriters are like speaking through a character, right? Or they're speaking not not just their whole persona, but just like in that song, this is the voice of this person's point of view, and you're singing right. it. People get confused about like that, right? And I think art is sometimes the same way, where it's you must be obsessed with shopping carts, and it's like well. Not really. I kind of created a character that's obsessed with shopping carts. And then like, he kind of does the work. <laughs> like, and, and I know it sounds weird, but it's the way when you hear people talk about novels, they're like, well, I created this character. And that really dictates what the character does, because I know these kind of rules about the character, like Tolstoy saying that Anna Karenina was going to throw herself in front of the train as soon as she was sort of created. I forgot what the phrase is, but it's, it's, he didn't do it. She did it because he created her that way. Yeah. So there's there's so so that sometimes is hard because people want to see whatever you do as just this direct thing of like you're like obsessed with this or that and on the other hand like i guess i'm sure more obsessed with shopping carts than anybody else because i made this whole project about it right so they're not wrong but it's like a nuanced thing um but so one of the interest so another interesting experience i had with this is when i was making when I started making these fake exhibition posters for the Thorpe Gallery, like I, I started making work that I wouldn't normally make as to be on these posters. And some of them were paintings and I'd never really done paintings before. I hadn't really wanted to work in traditional mediums. These sort of abstract geometric paintings. And I showed them in Buffalo. I had the, there was part of a group show and I showed these paintings and I had the text on the wall that explained like the, where they came from, which was you know, sort of ironically came from these me making fictional work for these fictional characters. Right. But then once you're on the wall, like no one's going to read that text or understand yeah. it or take it in. And the painting exists on the wall as an object. And, and people like bought those paintings. So, so I was, I was like, well, all right, I guess I should just maybe like liberate myself from this like strict conceptual framework and just make some paintings, um, which I did. And I've been doing it since 2018. Um, and, you know, in a way, like I've, it had this, I, I backed into it ironically, but now I'm, it's interesting to have a pra part of my practice that is just actually about formal concerns. Do you know what I mean? Where it's like, I'm actually just yeah. making these compositions. And part of that was also this feeling of like, I'm as qualified as anybody else to make, you know, geometric paintings. Like I push shapes around like all day long. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. In, in, uh, in my fictional work, in my real work and all these other things. And so that was a situation where I realized like that wasn't a narrative I could control or that was really meaningful once it was outside of that project, you know? Um, and then it ended up liberating me to do some traditional thing. I thought I would never do is make these you know, paintings. Um, so yeah. So I guess those are just a couple of ways that I think about that. Yeah. I love that. I'll tell you what I love. Absolutely love the most about this entire conversation is we're talking about wildlife incursions into modern architecture. And throughout this whole episode, there's been a fly buzzing around the entire screen. Oh, yeah. Behind you. <laughs> so yeah, I know. The fly is like, he, the fly, he or she is part of this conversation. Very He's having funny. an excursion. Well, well, where's a spider when you need one? So gonna... I know. I know. <laughs> it's just so, it's just so, life is just bizarre. I, mean, I, I, I will say life is bizarre. Uh, so I want to ask a little bit about your inspiration in some of your methodology, because I saw in your um, bio and what I mentioned earlier is that you, you don't have any formal uh, education in the current area that you're working in, in your artistry. Yeah. So where, um, where do you, how do you create, like, what are your guidelines around the actual design application of, let's say, creating, you know, the the foundation um art elements color form those things what do you look to to help guide you outside of the the book covers and your research you use to create these yeah so well i well so i mean i didn't go to school i did go to like an arts high school and then my my i grew up in a very art oriented home because my father taught was an art historian later design historian and um also taught like he has like a textbook on perspective drawing that's been in print since like 1984 so i i did have a lot of art exposure as a kid my uncle my father's brother is also like a, a noted composer and 
um, of like fairly avant-garde music. So like I grew up with an I definitely with the ideas of these, you know, I grew up with a lot of like posters from the seventies from like Poland and Denmark. And, you know, I definitely wasn't like coming from a non art background. However, I did not go to college for art or design um, and sort of, or photography, which probably would have been the most, would have made the most sense for me. I did have a job like mopping up the dark rooms in college. Um, but I, um, and I realized everything I wanted to do late as I left college, I left school or, uh, and realized, oh yeah, graphic design. It's also like, I went to, I was from 92 to 96. So like everything was changing as far as what you could do on a desktop computer and, you know, what these different disciplines kind of meant and how accessible they were. So it ended up being that I could just kind of learn on the job. I kind of became a paid intern and at a place that designed science education materials and, and just learned. But what I really did was I, I did set about educating myself as far as like reading books about art and design, um, you know, going to as many, see as much art as possible. I'd sort of this after I it was after college, I went to Hampshire college in Amherst, Massachusetts, which is a pretty experimental school. And um, so I had an interesting education, but just more about writing about media than about making things. But then I, I got these work visas to go to England for six months and then Ireland for seven months. So I had this year abroad, kind of just working as like a bike messenger and a barista and stuff. And, uh, but in that time I was, as soon as I got out of school and didn't have the academic pressures, I just started like thinking about making art projects and trying to learn about graphic design and, you know, taking books out of the library. So I did a lot of reading and a lot of just exploration of stuff. And I always tell like students, especially design students that you, cause I've worked with interns before that are coming out of you know school, uh, programs and it's you there's stuff you learn in that i mean there's some basics that probably would have saved me some time along the way and some some things that would be helpful and i think that time to be creative would have been good but like ultimately you learn by looking at design and by making design you know and you're not all kinds of sensitivities that you're just not going to have right away that you have to develop um and that's what I did, you know, and I did that largely through looking and then through making my own projects and then getting you know, more client work. And so, so it's hard to say what the, what, I mean, I, la I probably lack some foundation, some foundational stuff, but like not that much of it. Do you know what I mean? Like it's, yeah. it's still, you, you pick up so much along the way. I mean, the people that I'm pretty intuitive when it comes to how I make designs, I think, or, you know, how I make things. Um, in other words, I'm not employing a lot of like complicated principles or thinking, I mean, I'm, I end up intuitively using these, a lot of these principles because I'm inspired by design that uses them. Do you know what I mean? More than I am like, yeah. maybe doing things directly. Um, and I think early on as an artist, my, I, I sort of, maybe was a little more self-conscious of like, oh, like a, what's a real, you know, what does it take to be taken seriously as an artist or be a real artist or, you know, or, or yeah. never felt like a sense of shame around like not going to like grad school or, or anything like that. I, I, then I realized like once you have a little bit of success, then that just becomes part of your narrative. Like it doesn't matter. Um, and in, in art so much. And then in design, like no one ever asks you where you went to school. Like it's a non, it's a non story here. Yeah, I've never yeah. known inquired at all. Um, because everyone just cares about what you do. Like, you know, it doesn't, it's not like being a doctor where like, Oh, you better have had a really super good education. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Like, yeah. you know, something I love about it, is it, it is a meritocracy that, you know, someone who has zero education, but has a good portfolio is far more valuable than someone who went to like Yale, uh, you know, grad school for graphic design, uh, who doesn't have a good portfolio. Yeah. And that's the beauty. Another beautiful thing about being an artist is that you're not so tied to the education and the formalities of making it really, whatever that means within your, your chosen profession. So the last question I want to ask you before we wrap up here is uh, what are some artists that you look to for inspiration, um, past artists or current artists? Yeah. Well, I, obviously as I'm into the sort of mid century stuff, I do draw a lot of inspiration from the past. Um, but a lot of my inf inf inspiration from the past is um, like graphic designers, many of whom are also artists. Um, like Rudolf de Harek is one, a book cover designer, these really amazing modernist covers. 
um, Fred Troller, another great designer. Um, they're, they're a long list. If you follow me, you'll see I post from those, those people a lot. Um, there are many more in that list. And in art, I think one of my big inspirations is um, Matthew Barney, um, the, who makes, you know, the sculptor and filmmaker. Um, not that I love everything that he does, but as a world builder, I really admire his, have admired his practice. And then I think, I think what I really relate to with the way I thought about some of my bigger projects is the way that he sort of builds this world that happens in the film. And then the objects in the gallery are kind of taken out of that conceptual space, you know, and manifested in the gallery or as photographs or as this or that. And I think that's how I tend to think of my bigger projects where it's like this big world of stuff. And then when I have a show, it's like, I can take things from, you know, different aspects of it can be made into the different works. And I really like that way of thinking about uh, creative space or conceptual space um, as, as a kind of like world that you can draw from as opposed to something that's kind of linear creation. Yeah. I love that. Right on. Well, I'm sad to say that we're going to wrap up because I want to talk to you all day and I've already gone over double the amount of time these normally go. So I, oh, really? I, 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 go on long, I go on long runs. I walk, so I really, really go. it's my fault. It's my fault. Cause I, I just, there's so much more I want to talk with you about, but uh, I want to be respectful of your time. Firstly, cause I know you have a ton going on. And secondly, I'm just really appreciative of, of you taking the time to, to chat with me and chat with our, our listeners and our viewers. And on that um, note, folks can find you at Montague Projects on Instagram and your website. It's also Montague Projects. That is M-O-N-T-A-G-U-E Projects. Julian, thank you so much. Again, congratulations on your... Uh, your exhibit and your house and all the other incredible stuff going on in your life and uh appreciate your time thank you so much i really enjoyed it have a good one guys